to start in Matthew 25. And we're just going to read verses 1 through 7 up front, and then we'll kind of come back to some other things. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 7. Hallelujah. Verse 1, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish, five were sensible. When the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take olive oil with them. But the sensible ones took oil in their flask with their lamps. And since the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout, here's the groom, come out to meet him. Verse 7. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. Verse 7. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. We bless you. We love you. We honor you. We glorify you. We just bow down before you right now in the name of Jesus. We declare that you are the only reason that we came here. Yeah, we're going to have breakfast. Yes, we, our brothers and sisters came, but we came to this building because if we were lacking something, we knew that you would supply it through those that are around us, and we receive it now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, right now. But more than that, we didn't come just to take. We came to put in, and everything that you gave us on this day, on this week, on this month, on this year, Lord God, everything that you have put in us, Lord God, we, we, um, we pour it out even now. And we worship you because you are the one Oh, God, you are the one that, that makes this life bearable. And not just this life. You're the one that at the end of this earthly life, you're the one that allows us to stand in your presence and worship instead of wish for eternity that we could. So we thank you. We love you. We bless you. Just veil me now. I don't have anything in my flesh to say, but I give you thanks, glory, honor, and praise, Lord God, that if I'm willing to open my mouth, then you're willing to fill it, and I surrender right now in the name of Jesus. I bless you, honor you, glorify you. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. The title of this message is Trimmed and Burning. Trimmed and Burning. Now, I, God gave me this particular um, portion of scripture, and we'll, we'll finish it out. But I need you to, because we tend to go to sleep when it was like, oh, I've heard that verse before. And then we kind of go into this mental, like, ah, familiar enough. I know the story. I don't know where, I know where he's going. We're good. But that's why I stopped where I stopped. Because we've heard a lot of, um, a lot of, of, of sermons and um, sermonettes and just things that come out of the fact that in this particular moment, you have 10 um, people, 10 virgins. Now, mind you, we have to recognize that this is, this is God pointing to the kingdom and the brides are, are the church. Not the women in the church. The church. And, and what he's pointing to is that um, with the body in and of itself, we are all brothers and sisters, yeah? But some of us in this room right now don't have enough oil to get through tomorrow. And what we are relying on are the people that do have enough oil to let us borrow a little bit so that we can get through the next thing. Because every time adversity comes up, we need some oil to make sure that we can light the way. And the issue is we have created in the church, in the body, in the ecclesia, we have created a culture of, of being able to, li um, to live off somebody else's light and somebody else's worship and somebody else's prayer and somebody else's press and somebody else's relationship and somebody else's stuff. And what ends up happening is that we go home and we don't know how to do what we've been able. So we start copying things yeah. instead, of, um, instead of really seeking out the relationship. Okay, watch this. You ever, anybody ever been down, rough day, just real heavy, that kind of thing? You ever find yourself in the position where you're with somebody who wasn't having a, a good a, a down day? They were having a real good moment. They were bubbly. They were nice. They were all kinds of different things. And in their presence, you felt full. And you all of a sudden, it was like, oh, this day just got better. And then as soon as you parted ways, you couldn't understand why you were in the same spot. And sometimes worse, because you experienced a joy that you did not have, and you left all of it on the table when you left because it wasn't yours in the first place. Amen. Does that sound familiar? Amen. The reason that we find ourselves in places, you know, uh, partly is because we didn't have enough oil. See, relationship will put us in the position to, to obtain oil. Obedience is what stores up. Come on. Amen. 
Obedience to the Holy Spirit builds the supply. So let's go back to the fact that most of us don't have enough oil. But obedience is what builds the supply. Jesus. Think about it. If, if you knew that tomorrow we're going water skiing, who would be excited about that? My knee's too bad. It wouldn't be me. But if you know that you don't have any skis, what would you do? Or at least, if you don't have them, either I'm going to buy them, or I'm at least ask the person that I'm going with, hey, do you have a set that I can? Yeah. And my relationship with the person is going to determine whether I have to pay for it or not. See, if my relationship with the person is that they're a shop owner and I'm, I'm a customer, I'm going to have to pay for that. But if it's my daddy... then it's already provided. Yeah. Matter of fact, he knew I didn't have skis in the first place. Uh -huh. Ooh, y'all not going to follow me today. Listen, <laughs> in the name of Jesus, we are going into a different level of glory, yeah. and we will take these steps today. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So now watch this. My relationship with the boat owner determines whether or not I have to pay to get on the boat. And many of us in the natural, we are willing to, um, to, to dot all of the I's and cross all the T's. But what we don't realize is that what we do in the natural, in the spiritual, doesn't necessarily relate. Come on. Amen. Some of us are dotting T's and crossing I's and we can't figure out why in the world it's not working. Uh -huh. Come on. Okay, so watch this. Relationship with the Holy Spirit is what gives us access to the oil. Right. Obedience to the, um, to the Holy Spirit allows him to transfer the oil that he is in abundance. He is the oil, Amen. and he supplies it in our lives. And as long as we are obedient to him, then there is a free flow of his oil on our lives. Yes. But what we find in this scripture is not just a storage of oil. It is some, it is some virgins who also have to use said oil to produce a fire. And the, what I found out with, um, with oil lamps is that there's, there's really only a few components, right? There, there's a basin where you, where you keep the oil. And, and then there's a, a mechanism um, up top that allows you to, to hold a wick so that it doesn't just sit down in the oil. And then there's the wick that most of it is saturated inside the oil. Yeah. And a little piece of it comes up to the mechanism and then you light the top so that the flame doesn't just go down into the basin. Because the point of the Holy Spirit coming upon us is longevity in Christ. See, if you, all you want is a quick experience with Jesus, you don't need the Holy Spirit. This makes sense? See, this is why some of us are seeking after deliverance, but we don't stay delivered, because we don't seek after the one that keeps us delivered. You know what? Jesus, I need to lose weight. I'm going to stop eating bread today. <laughs> and then, and then, but I really don't have it in me to, to continue not eating bread to, um, for the rest of, so what I'm going to lose today, tomorrow I'm going to gain it back because I'm going to eat my pancakes. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Does this make sense? Yeah. Uh, oh, you know what? I need to get in better shape. I'm going to go walking today, and I'm going to walk for about 10 minutes because, you know, baby steps, you got you to work yourself up into it. <laughs> Right. But then tomorrow mm, I went walking yesterday. I should be fine. Oh, and then and then on Tuesday, it's like, ah, it's Tuesday. We don't walk on Tuesdays. And then Wednesday and then and then on Wednesday, I should go walking. But, oh, it's raining in Indiana. I can't go today. <laughs> Do you know what the humidity is today? Anybody got time for that? So we don't have any longevity in the thing that we have because we don't seek out the portions that allow us to remain faithful to the thing that we're called to. Because what we're called to is bigger than your willpower. Yes, it is. It's bigger than your, obi uh, your ability to obey. As a matter of fact, if you don't have any desire to sacrifice, then this isn't really the walk for you. Amen. But God... God didn't call you into salvation for you to die when you, um, when you got saved. Because if you died when you got saved, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. 
But the fact that he left you on this planet means that one, he had to give you something to sustain you. Two, he had to give you a purpose because there's no reason for you to be here other than the fact that he gives you something that everybody else needs to see through you. Amen. Amen. We have pushed to God responsibility that he gave to us. So that brings us to verse seven. All right, actually, let's, let's go back to um, verse five. You've got these, these virgins that are in a place. They have been called apart, away from the rest of society. And they are together. This is the body. Some of them brought oil, some of them didn't. We're, we're together. But see, Jesus is coming soon. Come on. Don't you know that they said, like Peter said that? In Acts. Pe like Peter. Right. The one that walked with Jesus. Right. And even if he was on some Methuselah stuff living 900 years, that's still a thousand plus years too short. You get what I'm saying? So we've been saying to the entire world, Jesus is coming back soon. And I believe that we have gotten to the place where we say it, but we don't really act like it. Because if we acted like it, we would have full conversations as, unless ever going to the doctor and it's like, hey, listen, I keep having this particular pain. So they give you something for the pain, but they never actually dig further to figure out what's causing it. Right, so, so we deal with, we throw, we throw Band-Aids on symptoms in the body. And then we expect, holy, oh, well, the Holy Spirit is gonna fix, true. But it's on us to allow him access to things that we really haven't given him access to. How does that apply? Verse 7, then all the virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. One of the things that is required for an oil lamp, or any candle for that matter, is for you to trim the wick down to a really small size. And the problem with the wick is that if it's too long, um, especially in oil lamps, it's still saturated. It's still pulled oil up. But now if so much is burning, that means you're going to burn through your supply too quick. And it burns too hot, so you get soot. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Come on. <laughs> you ever walk with Christ and, and feel like every time you start doing something, it's like, why, is it, why does it get too cloudy in here? What's the soot? Why is it, why is it dirty? That it's, it's because your wick is too long. If you trim the wick down, then it, only the portion that needs to be burning right now is burning and you save your fuel, and you don't um, produce so much heat that you burn up things around you. You ever find those people that are so holy that everybody else that comes in, we, are you too hot to handle? Why is it that Jesus could walk through crowds? Why could he sit in the midst of multitudes and everybody walked away wanting more, but people can't sit in, in our presence sometimes and not feel like we've been burned by them? Anybody that's holier than Jesus, ooh. Does that make sense? So watch this. What is that wick thing? It's, it's our thoughts. It's, it's our self-importance. It's, it's, our, it, it's our persona. That wick represents the, the parts of us that are really supposed to die. It's our soulless plan. And if we don't keep the wick trimmed, then what we th um, call passion is really wearing ourselves out and we find ourselves in a place where we can't maintain what God has given us because it's too much of us and not enough of him. Does, my Bible tells me that I have to decrease so that he can. Do you realize that the brightest flame always comes with a trimmed wick that's also, especially, and I, I learned this, I didn't know this until I started studying. If you cut it straight across, it, how it's cut determines how the flame burns. And the brightest flame is a trimmed wick that's also kind of a, it's, it's a point in the middle. It's the warmest, it's the brightest light, and it lasts the longest. 
So when we're trimmed and we keep ourselves small, but everything that we do have points to him. So the virgins got up because they heard that the, um, the groom was here and they trimmed their, they submitted to him. They repented. That, that's, that's our word. They, they asked for forgiveness. They recognized that if it's too much of me, I can't go into his presence anyway. But here's the thing. The foolish ones didn't even have enough oil to leave where they were to go into the presence of the groom. But if you keep reading, you recognize that where the groom is was an extremely well-lit place. So why is it that I needed oil and a flame in my lamp to get into the presence of the one who is light? Because darkness has no place in him. And if we get to the place where we don't have enough in us, then we don't look like him. And he then has to turn around and tell us that something that we don't want to hear. Matter of fact, let's, let's go um, verse 11, Matthew 26. This is after they've asked for oil. This is after they've gone to try to, um, to, to purchase some. They've gone to the wedding banquet. Matter of fact, verse 10. Go back to verse 10. When the foolish had gone to buy some, the groom arrived. Then those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. But he replied, I assure you, I don't know you. Because it's the oil that marks us. If the Holy Spirit is what we are responsible for, and obedience to the Holy Spirit provides us oil, then relationship then comes through obedience to the Holy Spirit. But how do we know how to obey the Holy Spirit? The Word of God. Amen. Is this making sense? Yeah. Good. So now, in all of that, we still have to trim our lamps to keep them burning. Amen? Amen. So listen, we're not, we got to get to a place where we're not managing our flesh anymore. We got to kill it. Some of us employ our flesh when we get into a bind, and adversity comes, and, and then our attitude comes out, and then all of a sudden, we, I handled that. No, you messed that up. Because now your witness is tarnished because you've left soot in a place where it should be clean. Yeah. Amen. Let's move on because Jesus, we, we just gonna have to do this. Amen. So John chapter 12. Now this is, um, this is Passion Week. Amen. And today is Palm Sunday. And this is the day that um, it's recorded that when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, that everybody was cheering, John chapter 12, um, that everybody was cheering and, and Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Most High. Everybody was happy about him being there, except he, he knew wh why he was there. It, whenever you walk into a place where you have responsibility and everybody else only has opinions, you have to recognize that in that place there are going to be a lot of people that are happy about stuff that you know that you're going to have to sacrifice for. And the hard part is explaining to people your sacrifice when all they really wanted was your victory. But there are people that didn't think that. They knew God enough and were sensitive to him enough to do something a little bit different. Um, John chapter 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Now, John chapter 11 is where Lazarus was raised from the dead. And this is back, this is Jesus back in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So Jesus had raised him from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving, which was normal. Lazarus was one of the ones reclining at the table. He was, he was chilling in his resurrection. <clears throat> like of all the people that could say, I should be dead, no, for real. You, <laughs> you were. You, were. you know what I mean? <laughs> Verse 3, then Mary took a pound of fragrant oil, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, so the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Mary took a pound of fragrant oil, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. Now watch this. The nard that she had um, anointed his feet is called spike nard. Now spike nard, this is, they're, in, they're in Bethany. 
the, the plant that is used to make spikenard, is on, it only grows in the Himalayas, in India, and in Nepal. You can't even find it in, in Bethany. Watch this. The thing that God is trying to anoint you with is not found in your flesh. It's not found in your immediate surroundings. It's not found in your, in your natural mind. It's not, it's not found in the strength of your hands. Where it's found is in him, in a, in a small place that is removed from where you are. So the reason it was expensive is because she couldn't readily put her hands on it once it was used. Now that pound is about 16 fluid ounces. It is so fragrant that you don't need a whole pound. You get what I'm saying? You, you don't need a whole pound to do what it, but she poured herself out to the point that if you aren't the one that I'm giving my all to, I don't need it. Because she watched him raise her brother from the dead. How many times do we see things reported in the Bible? in our communities. This person had a sickness, had a cancer, had a tumor, had a this, and God miraculously healed them of that. But then we should then go back and worship the Father based on the miracle that we saw. Amen. Amen. But people without enough oil get mad because I need something and you didn't give it to me. <laughs> but watch this. She didn't just pour it on his feet. She then wiped his feet with her hair. Now, Paul will then, um, there's, there, later on in the Bible, Paul will bring out the fact that um, because of, of the hierarchy, the, you know, Jesus is the head of the body and the man is the head of the woman and the woman, so Jesus is man's glory. He's really the glory of us all. But then the covering, and especially in Hebrew culture, the, the hair on a woman was her glory, which is why she had to cover it because that meant submission to a greater thing. You get what I'm saying? So she took her hair, which was her glory, and she wiped his feet, which we find out another chapter later, if you're going to clean the feet of somebody else, that is the lowest, lowest job in the kingdom. That's the lowest job in the house, is to serve somebody where they're the messiest to serve somebody where they hurt the most, to serve somebody that in a place where if, if you do this, then they can go further and be better because beautiful are the feet that carry the gospel. Amen. But she submitted the best of who, the glory of, the, of who she was symbolically, and then she wiped his feet with them. But watch this. It wasn't just the fact that she submitted so much to him. She poured out everything that she had of value. And then she, uh, she submitted herself in such a way that her whole ego was dead. Yeah. And when she did it, the fragrance of the thing that she had poured out filled the room. Okay, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. 2 Corinthians um, 2, 14 through 16. Watch, watch this. Because sometimes we don't, we, don't, we don't get it. So verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, but thanks be to God who always puts, on, um, puts, puts us on display in Christ and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. How do we really walk in revelation? Submission. When you submit to the spirit, the spirit pours. Not my opinion. Come on. 
Amen. But we have conversations. It's not a battle of, of things that should be or shouldn't be. What it is, and it's, it's, all it is is submission to Christ. But when you submit to Christ in such a way that all we see is Christ, hmm. the anointing takes over. Forget the fact that they were serving dinner. They were serving dinner. But it was the fragrance of the anointing that filled the room. There was hot food in the place. <laughs> but it's the anointing that filled the room. When she turned around and wiped his feet with her hair, the essence of what she had poured out that she had gotten from him filled the So that means everywhere that she went, it smelled like him. Everything that she did Smelled like him. Every time she moved and the wind blew through her hair, it smelled like him. Every time she bowed down and her hair was in her face, she smelled him. Every time she embraced somebody else, they smelled him. I don't, so every time you go to work, we ought to smell him. Every time you show up, you ought to smell him. But here's the thing that I can guarantee you every single moment of every single day. If adversity is not here, it's coming. So what is it that allows us to maintain the fact that they smell him is us trimming our wick back so that we don't get in the way. What happens when you're trying to minister to somebody? God is, is working in your life, and he's, trust me, you, you, he loves you in such a way that he wants to, to anoint you. He wants to move through your life. He wants to do that thing, and then somebody comes into the room that you haven't um, forgiven yet, and all of a sudden, you are now out of the flow because why? Your, trip, your, your, your wick isn't trimmed. Does this make sense? See, right now in this moment, this isn't about hearing words. This is about examining self. Like, Lord, where, where am I in your way? If miracle signs and wonders should follow those who believe and they're not following me, where am I in your way? If everybody is sick around us and nobody's um, praying in faith and nobody's laying hands and nobody's recovering, where am I getting in your way? If the fullness of joy is in the presence of the Lord and nobody in here is in joy, where am I getting in your way? Does that make sense? So the thing about it is, this isn't about us. This is about him. And if it's going to be about him, then everything that's in us has to die so that he can then live through us. In 2020... I believe that God shut everything down. He allowed it. He didn't, am I telling you that 600,000 people, like it was his plan to kill 600,000 people? No, I don't, I don't say that. But I do know that what he did in his church was try to prove to us that the church wasn't the building in the first place. So if you go home and you can find Jesus in your home, then when the building opens back up, you don't have to um, rely on the crutch that has a sign out front and an address. But if you couldn't find Jesus at home, then he was trying to show you that you didn't have enough oil and the trick, that your wick needs to be trimmed. So then when he opened the building back up, then, <laughs> then we had, the, we had this, uh, this epiphany. Like, wait a minute. Everybody that was coming to the building before COVID isn't coming back. And the reason I don't think he allowed some people to come back is because we weren't supposed to come back and just be here anyway. We had to realize that we had to go to them.
So what does that look like? If, if I don't have the aroma of Christ on me in my neighborhood, then what are we really doing when we come here? If, if, if I can't go to work and people see enough Christ on me that even if they never, if they never come to me and say, hey, oh, there's something about you, man. And I've been struggling and I just feel like you're the person that I need to talk to. That may never happen. That's fine. But if there's not something on our lives that at least plants a seed where they have to go somewhere else and be agitated because the, the word of God is growing up in them, what are we doing when we come here? Because this is the place of equipping, not the place of the work. When we say things like the, the harvest is plenteous, he wasn't talking about in the building. Because for the harvest to completely be in the building, that means we would have to uproot an entire harvest somewhere else in the field that we're sent to, bring the whole field into the building to then reap the harvest in the building. But what should happen is that we have to get to a place where we are equipped here to go out and plant seeds there. And then once those seeds are planted, we come here so that if we are um, lacking in any way, we are built up, we are encouraged, we are sharpened, we are filled with the spirit in such a way because somebody else is going to help us walk, in, walk that thing out. And that's what community is for. But then when we're filled with the water that is the Holy Spirit, we still have to go back to where we planted seeds and everywhere that God sends us to water the seeds that have been planted. But if, if you think that harvesting means that they're going to come into the building, then we've missed him. I don't know why I made notes today, Jesus. I just. Amen. All this stuff was for me, clearly. But are we following? So now watch this. In, in John 12... Mary knew, um, knew Christ for who he was because she saw and believed. And then she was willing to give her all to make sure that he understood that she had come into position at his feet. But watch this. Watch this. Then she was able to turn around and take something to people that didn't, didn't come to the room. And she still smelled like him. Jesus. In Matthew, I believe it's, uh, yeah, 26. Yeah, Matthew 26. There's another anointing of Jesus. So now, in scripture, you have what Mary did several days before the Passover. This one comes two days before the Passover. Same city, different house. Amen? So watch this. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had a serious, he was a leper. Verse 7, a woman approached him because he was healed and Jesus could dwell and abide in the house. A woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive fragrant oil. It's the same spikenard. She pointed on his head as he was reclining at the table. Let's stop right there. Mary knew him well enough to humble herself at his feet. My Bible tells me that, you know, give and it shall be given un, unto you, pressed down, shaken together, runneth over, shall men give unto your bosom. And we want to use that for tithes and offerings. And the principle in and of itself holds true. The issue is that he didn't say if you sow money, it'll be sold back to you. It says whatever you sow. Jesus sowed righteousness 
among the people. So she sent a person, or so God sent a person to then pour over him what he had been pouring over other people. But understand something. I believe that he was anointed, and everybody say, that's just him. Ooh, say it loud. That's just him. him. Amen. So the reason that I think we see the anointing of the feet, he was anointed as a priest. One who worked on behalf of the people. I, I believe that the reason he was anointed over his head, because he was also anointed king. Some of us have anointed him priest, but we haven't received him as king. What does that look like? You, you ever had, matter of fact, anybody ever managed people before? Just raise your hand. Put your hands down. If you've ever ra- um, managed people, then you know that at least one person has not received you as the person who is supervising the task that they are responsible for. They've received you as one, but they haven't received you as the other. Come on. That's good. That's good. Jesus healed me, priest. Who's the one that made sacrifices for the people? The priest. Who's the one that went before the mercy seat for forgiveness, for atonement? The priest. Who's the one that can tell us what to do? King. Lord, my, my, my child is sick. I, I need you to heal him. Priest. Lord, my, my car has been acting up. I need, you to, I need you to make a way. Priest. Lord, this city has gone crazy. It was already crazy. We're just seeing a different side of it. But the city has gone crazy. I need you to give us something so that we can do a thing in this. Priest. My marriage is on the rock. Priest. Lord, I submit. Lord, I repent. Lord, I messed that up. I know that you wanted me to do it this way, but in that moment, my flesh stood up and was a grown man. King. King. The reason that we can't walk in the peace of the king is because we've only received him as priest. Everybody's not going to receive us. Scripture even said that if they hate you, (laughs) don't worry about it. They hate me too. Don't worry about that. But the issue is that we want compliance out of people who don't know our leader. But sometimes they don't necessarily comply to him because what we do is out of our own flesh. And we, have a, we feel like we have a priest that's going to fix some stuff if we mess it up. But we don't have a king that will ask if we should go into battle. Ai was a place that was so small that the children of Israel didn't even feel like they needed to send their whole army. They're small and they're weak. And Israel got their behinds whooped. And it wasn't until um, Joshua went back to the king and said, Hey, I'm sorry, I don't know what we're doing. He was like, get up. Why, you, why, why? Why are we doing this? Had you asked me, I would have told you that you got something going on, and I could have revealed that to you. You wouldn't have had to lose 3,000 people. But when we deny King his space, matter of fact, um, we, we make plans, and then God will bless it. I repent, Jesus. I'm sorry. Amen. Listen, one day I'm going to shout you. Today is not that day. But the thing that we have to come to and the place that we have to live in and reside in is simple. The reason that we don't see everything that God said we should see is because sometimes we haven't acknowledged him in every way that we ought to have acknowledged him. And the reason that we are every time, every Thursday, we seem to have run out of oil is because we were we were banking on Sunday to get us through Saturday. Jesus. 
Just let that sink in for a second. How many times have we come into a building, maybe this one, maybe another, and we were more concerned about the people that were in the building than the God that brought us all together? And sometimes we were so offended by some of those people, we couldn't even give them what God wanted us to give them. Or we couldn't receive what God had for us through them because we were so offended in our flesh. And that was the part that we had to cut down in the first place. Do you realize that some of the adversity that comes, comes because he's trying to get you to get self out of the way? Trouble is coming. It's coming regardless. Amen. Amen. Mario, will you come? So this is one of those moments where we see Jesus as priest. But he gave us a helper. He said that helper is going gonna, is gonna to teach you all the things. Yeah. And not only the things that, that he's going to show you beyond, he's going to bring back to remembrance all of the things that I gave you. Yes. But what does John 8 say? Starting around 31. Jesus said to the Jews who believed on him, believers, if you continue on in my teaching, you'll know the truth. And the truth is what makes you free. And they had the nerve to argue with him because they received him as priest, not as king. This is that moment of reflection.